Well, good morning. Welcome to Lake Lure Baptist Church. I pray that uh, you have been ministered to uh, this morning, and not only by the friendliness of the congregation, but also through song. And I pray that God will now minister to your hearts uh, through His Word. Would you open your Bibles to the book of Acts? And uh, we are in Acts chapter number 12 as we continue in our study uh, through this book, Acts chapter 12. As you're turning in your Bibles, I I did want to say a big thank you uh, to all those that came out yesterday uh, for the outreach um, at Camp Luercrest. I think we counted, uh, including the the American Heritage Girls that, that came out to help. I think we were right at 50 people from Lake Lure Church, and that is huge. Um, that, is, that is incredible. Uh, I wish I could get that many to come to church on a Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> so from now on, when you come on a Sunday morning, I'm going to make certain I've got a grinder for you to use and uh, paint brushes to paint, and uh, we've got a bunch of weeds out here you can go and pull. Uh, trees that will get cut down and that way you'll all come to church. Um, it is a spring break and so a lot of our families are away on, on spring break and so we just pray the Lord will keep them safe and rejuvenate them in the time that they're away and uh, they'll have to go on YouTube to catch up in our study. So in Acts chapter 12 uh, verse 1 through verse number 19. About that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the the brother of of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayers for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell, He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and uh, from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. There were many, where many were gathered together and were praying. And he knocked at the door of the gateway. A servant girl named Rhoda came to him. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But uh, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now, when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea 
and spend time there. This narrative, and I almost use the word story, but I'm trying to get away from this word story because a lot of people hear the story of in the Bible and they think it's a story. Uh, this is not a story. Uh, this is a true story. This is really what happened. And so that's very important for us to understand. Uh, this specific narrative that I've read to you um, has been the, the, the focus or the use for much comedy in the past. You know, Rhoda uh, shutting the door on Peter and uh, come back Rhoda. And, and people have made so many comedies, uh, stories and jokes about this passage. But I think they miss the point. Here is the point of this passage. God is in control. God is in control. The passage starts out with these words, and in that time, or about that time, Herod. Now, what is he referring to when he says about that time? Remember, whenever we're reading scripture, we want to take it in the context that it's given. So it's pointing back to the end of chapter 11, that speaks that there's going to be this time in, in which there will be a great famine coming upon the country. So in that time, a time of great crisis, we find that there's this man by the name of Herod. Oh, who is this Herod? Well, we know of Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great, he was the one uh, that killed all the babies. Uh, when we were in Israel, Lilani and I had the displeasure of uh, going into a, a cave or a tunnel that is right under or below the side of um, the, the church of the Nativity. And it's in this place, uh, as you go down these steps, no one's allowed in there. Uh, we, were, we were blessed or maybe unblessed after what we saw uh, to know uh, the, the, the guide who knew the guard that was uh, able to let us in. And this place is opened only once a year for certain priests to go down and, and they have a service down there. And so this is right off the courtyard uh, of the church of the Nativity where, where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And when you go down these steps, there is a, a cavern. And when you look into this cavern, uh, it has... Uh, uh, rails that stops you from going in so you can basically just peer in and when you look into that what you find is the, a lot of baby skulls and baby bones uh, it was a, a gruesome thing to see but it was a, a, a once again a reaffirmation of the wickedness of man and what satan would go to to try to stop the coming of the savior and so they, those bones are as one of the, the mass graves where the children that were killed at the time of the birth of Christ by Herod the Great. And that's not the Herod we're speaking about today. Then we know that there was a Herod uh, that Jesus came before. Uh, and this was the son of Herod the Great. And Jesus came before him and, and he mocked Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. That's not this Herod. Now we have this Herod who was uh, greatly hated by the Romans, hated intensely. And he was very, very dependent on the constituency of the Jews. He was the king of the Jews and he was very dependent of getting their favor. And so he would do absolutely anything in order to, gr to garnish the favor of the Jewish people. And so here we find not only a nation in crisis with regards to the famine that's in the land, but we also find a church that is in crisis because of a man who's seated on a throne who thinks that he's in control. God has never abdicated his throne. And God is always seated firmly upon his throne. Even in times when great persecution and great suffering comes upon the church. The church in its infancy uh, did not sit in the lap of luxury. Uh, it did not uh, have a time of uh, sitting back and just enjoying life. No, no, the church was persecuted just as Christ had said it would be. 
And so this passage, as we pick up in this time of crisis for the church, it is a time of crisis in that the church is being persecuted, not by the Romans, but is being persecuted by the Jewish people, and specifically by this man by the name of Herod. We're not going to get to the end of Herod this morning and not next Sunday either because that's Easter, uh, Easter Sunday. But the following Sunday, you're going to get to see one of the most gruesome deaths ever written of in the Bible. So don't go and read it now. Uh, wait till that Sunday. Okay, it's at the end of chapter 12. Um, I just see heads dropping. We're going to read this right now. I forget what you got to say. Um, <clears throat> a time of much persecution for the church. There are three people that are, or three groups that are mentioned in this passage when it comes to the church. The first one is a man by the name of James. Here it is. Verse 2, he, that is Herod, killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. So we need to know who this James is. This is not James, the half-brother of Jesus, that was the head of the church in Jerusalem. This is James, the brother of John. This is the sons of Zebedee. You remember Jesus walking and seeing uh, the sons of Zebedee sitting in their boat, and he called them to follow. You remember there was a woman that went to Jesus and said something like this, Jesus, when you get into your kingdom, can my boys, James and John, sit on either side, one on your left and one on your right? And Jesus' words to her was this, and to them was, can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? And Arrogantly, they said, yes, we can. And he said, well, indeed, you will drink of the cup that I will drink of. Well, what was this cup? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament specifically, uh, the, when we speak of the cup, was either drinking of the cup of the blessings of God or the cup of the wrath of God. Is this the cup of blessing? No, it's not. Is it the cup of wrath? No, it's not. Because Christ drank from the cup of the wrath of God. He drank full strength. From the cup of the wrath of God. So what cup is this? I believe this is the cup of suffering. And what he was saying to James and to John was, James and John, surely yes, you will drink of the cup of suffering. You're going to suffer. So this is the first and the only time that we hear of an apostle dying. In the New Testament. Only James is mentioned. And we know of others as they've been persecuted, but never their death. We see that here James is put to death by the sword. And that's a very important thing. It wasn't just put to death, but it was put to death by the sword. Well, why is that important? And why did that please the Jewish people? Well, Deuteronomy speaks of the fact that those that are... Um, those that are guilty of apostasy should not just be put to death, but to be put to death by the sword. And this pleased, this pleased the Jews. And so Herod is here garnering the, 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 um, uh, the support of these Jewish people by persecuting. And so it is here that James loses his head for Christ. It is here that as he is faced with persecution, his life is taken from him. But let me say to you this morning that uh, you can do whatever you want to a believer. You can never really take his life from him. You may take a physical life, but you can never take the spiritual life of the man. We who have been born twice, born of the flesh, born of the spirit, we will only die once, and that is physically. We will always continue to live eternally this crisis of death that James is facing is only the crisis of a physical death and not of an eternal death I wonder where Jesus was at this moment in time exactly where he was before and exactly where he is right now seated on a throne sovereignly in control James's head would not have been chopped off unless God allowed it to happen Nothing can happen outside of the control of God. 
It's a wonderful thing to know that even in the death of an apostle, that there is one that was holding his life in his hands and was right there, ever present. I think of another martyr in the, in the New Testament, a man by the name of Stephen. And as Stephen was being stoned to death, the scripture says he looked up and he saw Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is in control. He is seated on a throne. And his throne is high and lifted up. And we never need to worry about what the future holds. Even when he allows death into our lives. But there's another man that we read about and his name's Peter. Lilani was telling me a funny story about Peter, so I'll just tell it to you too. Teaching the, the, the little kids at the back there, and the scripture refers to Peter as Simon Peter. And the little ones were saying, Simon Peter, what in the world is that? How come he's got two names? And, and the little boy that said that, his name is Wyatt Mason. And so trying to explain this to Wyatt Mason, that he also has two names, Later on in the question and answer time to see if they remembered, Lilani said, so what was that guy's name? And he said, Peter Mason. <laughs> um, Mason Peter. Um, no, uh, he, Simon Peter, uh, here we find him being seized at a very specific time. He is taken at the time of unleavened bread. When is this? Well, this is the seven-day feast that would go after the Passover. You'd have your day, Passover, seven-day feast of unleavened bread. It would be a time in which a lot of people would be coming into Jerusalem. They would be flocking into Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be jam-packed with people. What an opportune time for Herod to show that he is the king. And so he arrests Peter puts Peter into jail, and Peter now faces a crisis of suffering. A crisis of suffering. You see, even though God allowed for James's life to be taken, a crisis of death, with Peter, he allowed just a crisis of suffering. Later on, we know that Peter will die. In fact, the scriptures tell us that when Peter is to die, that he will be crucified upside down. Peter will die at, at a point, but right now he is going to suffer for the cause of Christ. Notice the condition that he finds himself in. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was Though miss this, sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. The conditions in which he finds himself is in a prison. He's in a jail. Uh, it's not like our prisons today where they have a day room and a television and, and all that stuff. No, uh, this is in a dungeon. Uh, it, it is on a, a, a dungeon floor. Uh, one commentator said this, even on the cold dungeon floor, he can still lead you by the still waters and make you lay down in green pastures. And it stood out to me that his condition being in prison, he could still experience the peace of God. Can you imagine sleeping, waiting to be brought out and, and you've just seen James's head be chopped off? You know you're next. There's no way of escape. Uh, there are 16 soldiers, four for each watch, and they are one on each side and two at the door, and there's no way you're going to get out. And you know what he does? Sleeps. Could it be that this is that peace that surpasses all understanding? Christian, you may be suffering today. You may find yourself in a condition where you are suffering, where you are struggling. I want you to know that God is able to give you peace amidst the storm. 
He is able to give you peace amidst that situation. God is never a victim to your crisis. God is not uh, walking up and down, pacing the, the, the hallways of heaven, wringing his hands, worrying about what the future holds for you. And the scripture says that he loves us and he cares for us. And even in that time that we are suffering, time of persecution, a time of difficulty, that he is not a victim to our circumstance. In fact, he's the one who inaugurates the circumstance. Nothing can enter your life that does not pass through the sovereign hands of God. A very difficult place he found himself. But notice his actions. Action of submission. Just laying down, sleeping. Just resting in the fact that God is in control. I'm wondering where he got this from. Because the Peter that I know is the one that wants to jump out of a boat and go walk on water. The Peter that I know is the one that wants to open his mouth to change feet. The Peter that I know is the one that wants to chop someone's ear off. And I think that was a miss. He tried to get the guy's head. The Peter I know is a man of action. And here we find Peter in dire circumstances and he's just resting. Where does this come from? I believe it comes from the indwelt Holy Spirit. And that this was not Peter. That this was God in Peter. God enabling Peter to trust him. To trust him. But it's hard, I know. But he is able. I think the question that we pose to ourselves is this. Do we trust him? Or do we stand in his faith? That he is able. To keep us and to hold us. To protect us. I believe he is. And I think Peter is a testimony to that. But notice his deliverance. This deliverance that he experiences is a supernatural deliverance. So all of a sudden there's this light that shines. And he gets struck on his side. The chains fall off. The gates open. He walks out past one lot of gods, the next lot of gods, uh, and he gets to the iron gate that is now going to lead into the city. The gate isn't opened by anyone, but the gate just opens by itself, and he walks out. And God shows up amidst Peter's crisis. So if you're like Anton this morning, you're saying, why didn't he show up like that with James? Why didn't he show up like that with James? Surely, uh, for one man, he brings him out of prison. And this is not the first time, by the way. This is the third time. Third time that Peter's in jail and Peter is now being let out miraculously by God. Why would you do that for Peter and not for James? Why would you let James lose his head and not Peter? Because he's God. And God is always working all things to the good of those that love him. And we cannot begin to understand all that God's doing. But we can live a life of submission and saying, God, I in all that I am going to fulfill my responsibility through your enablement. And I'm going to trust you with the outcome. Whether it mean life or whether it mean death. Whether it mean difficulty or whether it mean uh, not that much difficulty. You, God, will be glorified in and through my life. Because I firmly believe that when James lost his head, he did not lose his head denying his Lord. When Peter was in jail, he did not stay in jail denying his Lord. Quite to the contrary. 
we're going to find just a little, a little later on that Peter will go, not run to get out of Jerusalem, but actually go and seek out the church. Now, that's a stupid place to go hide. By the way, if you want to escape from prison, don't go hide out at your mama's place because that's probably the first place they're going to go look. If you're a Christian and, and you're being persecuted, the, the, probably the last place you want to go hide is in the church because that's where they're going to look. And that's exactly where Peter goes. He goes to the church because the deliverance he experienced was a miraculous deliverance. You see, our God is the God that still does miracles today. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Hmm. You see, God is the God of miracles. And he may show up uh, in, the, in the miraculous, but there's other times that he shows up in providence. Sometimes he shows up uh, in, in, in the wow, and other times it's just through the way that he allows things to happen. But ultimately, God is in control. There is no Herod that can take the glory from God. There is no Herod that can take your life from the true king. There is no throne that can rule over the throne of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. His throne is high and lifted up. Lastly, look at his testimony. Verse 12. Well, sorry, verse 11. When, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. By the way, that's John Mark, the author of the Gospel according to Mark that will later go on a, a mission trip with Saul and Barnabas and then later just with Barnabas. Where many were gathered together and they were praying. When he knocked on the door of the gate where the servant girl of Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. And she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him, and they were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed, and he went to another place. Notice how interesting it is that when he's let out of prison, when he has experienced this miraculous, supernatural deliverance, that he does not go and hide in a cave, but the first place he goes is to the church, and he delivers a testimony. A testimony. He tells of what God has done. I've heard this passage preached that the only reason Peter went to prison was that there might be a testimony given. I don't believe so. I believe he went to prison so that God could show his sovereignty. I believe he went to prison so that God could be glorified. And I believe the means of that, firstly, was by testimony. That he might give testimony. Is there a man or a woman in this room? And you've been through the crisis of suffering you've been in a difficult place you've seen the hand of God at work in your life and you've not taken time to use that to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ God has given you a special gift and that gift is called a testimony I want to encourage you this is what Paul spoke about that we might comfort others with the comfort that we have received to use that testimony as an encouragement to the brothers and sisters in Christ. We have seen James, the crisis of death. We've seen Peter, the crisis of suffering. Now see the church, the crisis of prayer. Notice what the church is doing. Go back with me, if you would, to verse number, number five. So Peter was kept in prison... But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. 
And then when Peter gets there to the house after being delivered, uh, the people are there doing what? They are praying. This is a crisis in prayer. Uh, where do you go when you find yourself in a crisis? Where do you go when your family is in a crisis? Where do you go when the church is in a crisis? Many times we want to go to people and we want to tell them all our misery and our sorrow. And I'm not saying that there's not a place for us to, to speak to one another and encourage one another. But if you use prayer, the, the gift of God, as a last resort, you are selling yourself short. Notice firstly that prayer is a privilege. Uh, prayer is a privilege. And within this crisis that the church finds themselves, they're exercising the privilege of prayer. Well, what do you mean it's a privilege? Anyone can pray. Yes, but not anyone can pray to our Father who art in heaven. Because not everyone is the child of our Father who art in heaven. It's only those who have been born again, those that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ by the way of the blood of Christ, the way has been opened for us now to walk boldly into the throne room of God and humbly fall at His feet, drawing near to Him in our time of need that we might receive mercy. Oh, what a privilege it is to be able to come to the God who's seated on a throne. What a privilege it is to come to the Lord and, and bear our heart before Him. What a privilege it is to come to one that has suffered in every way as we are, and He understands. He's been tempted in every way as we have, and He understands. And we come to Him knowing that He is able. God is sovereign he does not only decide the outcome, but He also decides the means. And there are certain things that God has chosen that He will use prayer to achieve His will. We have the privilege of participating in the sovereign will of God through a vibrant prayer life. This is the privilege of the church. But notice this prayer had a pattern to it. Notice the pattern of the prayer. Uh, verse 5 said, But earnest prayer was being made for him. Earnest prayer. Well, when, when we hear this word earnest, it speaks of, of that which is honest, that which is with a fervency, that, that which has uh, a, a sense of passionate uh, declaration in it. it. It is coming before God and it is laying it out. Uh, this is not, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep and if I die before I wake. That is a terrible prayer to teach your children. If I die before I wake. All right, sleep now, little boy. This is earnest prayer. This is the church deciding we're going to get real in our conversation with God. When last have you gotten real with God in your prayer life? When last have we as a church gotten on our knees and truly bore our hearts before God? Sometimes we find ourselves so busy with other stuff, so busy trying to keep a finger in the dike. You all know the story of that. Or is that just a South African thing? Oh, you know that story. Good, just checking. Uh, sometimes we find ourselves so busy putting a finger in the dike, trying to keep the wall from falling in, that we forget that the answer is not found in putting a finger in the dike. The answer is found on falling on our knees before God and saying, God, if you're not going to do it, it's not going to happen. How earnest are we in our prayers? Or have we just become so superficial that we hydroplane over these, these silly little prayers, hydroplane, just trying to get to the amen so I can get on with my life? Listen, there's no power in that prayer. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervency, earnestness, desirousness. Let me stop you and say, dads, Men, are you leading your homes 
to pray? Or are you so busy at trying to put a finger in the dike, trying to keep the boat afloat, that you forget that you have a privilege to pray? And prayer has a pattern, and the pattern is one of fervency, unendingness, continual. This is what the scriptures speak of when it says to pray without ceasing. But not only the pattern of this prayer, but notice the power in the prayer. I, I'm, I'm going to make a statement, and it, it will... It, it may sound heretical to you uh, until you understand it. There is absolutely no power in prayer. But there is all power in the one that we pray to. Did you get that? Everybody prays. Now, whether they... Whether they pray like we think it should be praying or just speak to some God or some thing out there. There's no power in those prayers. The power lies within the God to whom we pray. In other words, the, the, the one who gets up and, and worships his Hindu gods or the one that gets up and, and bows down before uh, Allah uh, on a daily basis. There's absolutely no power in that prayer because the prayer is directed in the wrong place. Notice when the scripture says they prayed, they gave earnest prayer to God. I find that interesting that the scripture did not just say uh, while he was kept in, in, in prison uh, by earnest prayer or they made earnest prayer as the church. But it says, to God. Why is this, 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 this uh, two little words put in there, to God? I, I think it makes a difference to whom you address your prayer. And so there's much power in prayer that is prayed to the powerful God. When we pray to God, recognizing who He is, it means that we're coming to Him, recognizing that this is the all-powerful God. This is the God that speaks and, and worlds come into being. This is the God that is able to continue to sustain the entire creation by the power of His Word. This is the God that is able to do the absolute impossible. This is the God that knows all things. This is the God that died for you, loves you, has shown grace to you, continues to hold out mercy to you. This is the God that never changes this is the God that is infinite in His being, has no beginning and no end. This is the eternal God. And you get to walk into His throne room and speak with Him. This is not just a privilege, but it should be the pattern, understanding that the power comes in knowing who we're praying to. So here's a convicting question for me. When I go in my prayer closet and I bow before the King of Kings, do I pray with a sense of absolute expectancy and a sense of anticipation, knowing that He not only hears, but He answers my prayer? What about you? Has prayer become so rout? Has prayer become the add-on where the church models for us that when it is in crisis, it goes to God? But you'll notice that it's not just when it goes in crisis. When you go back and you read about the church specifically in Acts chapter 2, it says that they gave themselves to, to his teaching, gave themselves to prayer. When we find in Acts chapter 6 that there's this, the, the falling out between 
the, the widows uh, or the woman with regards to the distribution of bread, you find that the apostles say this, why should we wait on tables when we should give ourselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer? Why is it that we see throughout the scriptures they were praying, they were praying, they were praying, they were praying. And then when we think about our prayer lives, sometimes it's just either non-existent or it is superficial or it is non-expectant at best. I will never forget the day that the Lord challenged us as a church to pray for big things. That was four years ago. Five years ago. Time flies. And you're sitting in the result of praying big prayers. That God provided all the funding for this building and all the others. Spent over a half a million dollars and God gave it all. And that came because God is the one who answered the prayer. How surrendered are we to him in seeking a life that reflects this pattern, this privilege, and this power in prayer. I want to close by reading you a short statement by E.M. Bounds. One of the best books I've ever read on prayer is a compilation of his works. It's called E.M. Bounds on Prayer. E.M. Bounds on Prayer. And this is what he said with regards to men and women who will be absolutely sold out in willing to surrender themselves and give themselves to him in prayer with an expectant heart. Bound said, God can work wonders if he gets a suitable man. For God wants elect men, men of whom self and the world have gone by a severe crucifixion, by a bankruptcy which has totally ruined self and the world, that there is neither hope nor desire for recovery. Men who by this insolvency and crucifixion have turned toward God with perfect hearts. Read that again. God can work wonders if he can get a suitable man. For God wants elect men, men of whom self and the world have gone by a severe crucifixion, by a bankruptcy which has to so totally ruined self and the world that there's neither hope nor desire for recovery. Men who by this insolvency and a crucifixion have turned toward God with perfect hearts hearts would this reflect you and I today that we have become so bankrupt so insolvent so self crucified that we have nowhere else to go no one else to come to but him that the heart that we turn to him in prayer is not a double minded heart it's not a heart that wavers between opinions, but it's a heart that is sold out to God in saying, God, have your way, have your will. You are able. I trust that you are in control. In this passage we read today, it was all about crisis. There was a crisis nationally. There was a crisis for James. There was a crisis for Peter. There was a crisis for the church as a whole. I don't know what crisis you may be going through, but I want you to know this. We serve a God who's in control. He's the God of supernatural deliverance, but he's the God that's always available to you. Will you turn to him in your crisis? Will you trust Jesus? Or whom will you trust? Where will you go? Where will you seek the answer to your crisis? I believe that it's to be found in one place and one place only before the throne of the King of Kings 
and the Lord of Lords. The question is, will you bow before him? Let us pray. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to give you an opportunity to respond this morning. I don't know where you find yourself. I don't know what crisis you may be in. Maybe you're just coming out of a crisis or maybe you're just about to head into one, but at some point in time, we all face these crises in our lives. Know that God loves you, that He is able to provide all that you need. He waits for you to call upon Him. Just where you're seated right now, would you identify what, what that is in your life that you're going through? And I've got a few questions for you. And I want you to answer them just quietly on your own. The crisis you're facing, is this a crisis of sin? In other words, you're in a, in a, in a place that is a, a place of your own making. It's because of your sinful actions. The answer to that is there's time for repentance now. That's the work that God wants to do in your life. You cannot seek the blessing of God and His comfort amidst sin. And so why would you not turn from that and say, Here I am, Lord. Or maybe you're finding yourself in a crisis that is, is of your no, your no making. It's just, it's come upon you. Would it be that you should be praying this morning, God, give me grace to make it through this. Lord, if you choose to deliver me from this, I will glorify you in that. If you choose to keep me in this, I'll glorify you in that. God, let your will be done. Give me a mind that is, is steadfast upon you. So, Father, I lift up my brothers and sisters before you. You know the needs, you know the concerns, you know the crises that they may be facing. Lord, you know what the future holds. You know the past. You know those things that we hide from all because, God, your word says that you see into our hearts. There's nothing hidden from your eyes. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would meet with each individual in this room in a very special way. Lord, would you have your way in our lives? Show us that, God, that you want to do in our lives. Lord, help us to get rid of the, the question, why God, why God? And, and, and to ask you, Lord, what is it? What is it that you're wanting to do? What is it, God, that we might be vessels unto your honor? Lord, would you equip us at Lake Lure Church with a great testimony for you that we might be able to say that our God is in control, our God is on the throne, So as we prepare to leave this place and as we prepare to enjoy a meal together, Father, we ask that you would bless that food. And Lord, I pray that our time seated around those tables, enjoying one another's fellowship, the time around the tables, enjoying um, the food would be honoring to you. And Lord, that the thoughts we think and the words we use might bring you glory. May you be honored in the time of fellowship that we'll go into at this moment. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.